morning. This morning, we continue in our summer sermon series where each week we are walking chapter by chapter through the book of Acts as we study and explore the movement of the early church. And so this morning, we find ourselves in the second half of Paul's second missionary journey. In your bulletin, you will find a map and you will see that we filled in the journey thus far that we took last week when we ended in Philippi. We've left the rest empty for you to follow along and to fill in as we go forth this morning. Also, if you want to take your Bible and flip to Acts chapter 17, we're going to spend time in 17 and 18 this morning if you want to follow along. If you remember, we left Paul last week. Paul and Silas had been beaten and they had been imprisoned in Philippi for proclaiming the message of Christ. While they were there, they shared the message of Christ with a jailer. And he, along with his entire family, were baptized. Well, the next morning, city officials and magistrates sent word to Paul and to Silas that they could be released. And Paul informed the jailer that he, as well as Silas, was a Roman citizen. Now, there is strict protocol if you're a Roman citizen Uh, specifically that no one receives punishment, particularly a beating, before having a trial. It's similar to us, innocent until proven guilty. And so Paul says, if they want me to leave, then I want them to come and beg. In fact, I want them to come and plead for for me as well as for Silas to leave. And so what we find in our scripture, it's going to pick up at the end of 16 in verse 37 when he says these words. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. We see that Paul demanded for the authorities personally to come. But even with his back probably still bearing and oozing the wounds from the night before, his thoughts are of others. Because what he knew is that if there was a public and official pleading and apology, then what would happen is that those early Christians would know that it was not against the law and it was not violating any Roman law to worship Jesus. He knows that this early Philippian church that's filled with these neophyte Christians, that they can move forward unhindered, even gain momentum when it comes to being faithful followers of Jesus Christ, if these authority figures in the community speak out. And speak out, they did. They came, and they begged, and they pleaded. Now, as we study this, the interesting thing that we may question is why didn't Paul inform them that he was a Roman citizen before he was beaten, before he was put in shackles, before he was imprisoned for a night? Why didn't he say, whoa, 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 there's a protocol here. I'm a Roman citizen. We're a Roman citizen. We need to have a trial. I think one of the reasons he didn't is because Paul knew if he were to even suffer in the name of Christ, that God perhaps could advance his mission in that community. And we get a read of this, actually, when Paul writes back to the Philippians in chapter 1, verses 12 and 14. He says, brothers and sisters, I want you to know the things that have happened to me have actually advanced the gospel. The whole praetorium guard, everyone else knows that I'm in prison for Christ. Most of the brothers and sisters have had more confidence through the Lord to speak the word boldly and bravely because of my jail time. Paul knew that his own suffering could be used by God to advance Christ's mission. So much so that people would look and see what Paul would endure and they would say, this message that he proclaims, beating after beating, and yet he still proclaims the message of Christ, there's got to be something to this. This has got to be the real deal. And so it undergirded those early believers with a sense of bravery, with a sense of boldness of what it meant to proclaim the message of Christ. 
Now, Paul and Silas were released, and as would probably many of us, having spent the night in jail, having been beaten and bruised, we probably would have headed home, licking our wounds, would we have not? Not Paul and Silas. Before they leave town, they meet with Lydia. If you remember, last week was the first convert on European soil. Also, her home becomes perhaps the first house church in Philippi. And he meets with them and encourages the new believers. We then hear that from there, he leaves Philippi and he travels through Amphipolis and Apoll Apollonia to Thessalonica. So if you are following along in your bulletin, you can begin to fill that in. Now when we hear Thessalonica, we should be familiar with that. For we have first and second Thessalonians. That is written specifically to this community. We also realize that Paul had a rhythm when he entered any new city. Where's the first place that he went? To the synagogue. And sure enough, we see that in verse 2, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. And as Paul quickly learns, he encounters uh, persecution. And in verse 5, it says, but the Jews were once again jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob and they started a riot in the city. Scripture then says that they go in search of Paul and Silas and Timothy. And they go to a house of a man by the name of Jason, who they believe is having them stay at his home. Because Paul and Silas and Timothy aren't there, they actually drag Jason out into the streets. And we hear in verse 6 that these men, meaning Paul, Silas, and Timothy, this is what they're saying about them, have turned the world upside down. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Look at the power of these words from those that are opposed to the message of Christ. These men say that they have turned the world upside down. What kind of reputation these Christians already have, even by those who oppose the message, they know that the gospel of Jesus Christ has the ability to revolutionize lives, to break down social barriers, to throw open prison doors, to cause people to care deeply for one another, to also invite people and compel them to worship Almighty God. You see, in Paul's time, as well as in ours, we know that Jesus is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. That it is not Caesar, that it is not anybody else. We also know that God's kingdom is very different than any earthly kingdom or empire. And we, along with those around us, should hear the message of Christ through not only the way we live, but through the message that we proclaim and should say, my goodness, these are men and women who turn the world upside down. And so I ask you that when it comes to your faith journey, how has God rocked your world? How has your own heart been turned upside down because of the message of Jesus Christ? You see, some 2,000 years later, we still see that Jesus is turning the world upside down. That even today, this gospel message is, a, is against the social norms and conventions of our time and is built upon the foundation of a man who chose to go to the cross so that we might have life? How does this even happen? We see that it happens because Jesus is in the business of turning the world upside down. But not only that, he's in the business of transforming your life from the inside out. You see, as Paul begins to proclaim this message all throughout Thessalonica, he then realizes as the new believers that his life is in jeopardy. 
He's been pro proclaiming it with such bravery and such boldness that now he is asked to leave by those that are following and believers of Christ in order so the message can continue. So he leaves from Thessalonica to Berea on the journey. And as he's in Berea, we learn just a brief piece in Scripture that this is a place that was hungry for the Word of God. That they not only hear Paul's preaching, but they begin to explore and enter into the Word of God to discover if what Paul was saying was actually true. And what Paul knew is that these early believers needed a shepherd. So he left Silas and Timothy in order to continue to form and shape and fashion these new believers. And he leaves from Berea to Athens. Now, many of us are familiar with the city of Athens. It is named after the virgin warrior goddess Athena. And during Paul's time, Athens would have been filled with temples to various god, gods. For example, there was a temple dedicated to Eris, the god of war, Poseidon, the god of the sea, Hephaestus, the god of craftsmen and metal workers. We know that two temples were created and constructed during Paul's time, the goddess Roma to Augustus, and also a huge massive temple to Zeus. What Paul also would have seen as he entered into Athens was a 30-foot high statue of Athena, which stood atop what is known as the Acropolis, almost 500 feet above sea level that would have been seen throughout the whole city. Athens is known as the birthplace of democracy as well as philosophy, and great debates would have occurred every single day at the Agora, which is their public square. And so in verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, meaning waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols, to see all of these temples everywhere. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Now, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were the dominant philosophers in Greek culture at this time. And they say, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, well, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus is a council of court it would have been the public square as we know it. That's where people would gather day in and night and just debate and philosophize about the meaning of life. The Latin translation of Areopagus is Mars Hill. Now, some of you may have heard the ministry of Paul on Mars Hill. That would be the scripture where we are. And so it continues where they said to him, may we know that this new teaching is that uh, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And so Paul was asked to explain what it is in greater detail that he is talking about. And we remember Paul's background. He is an educated rabbi. He's been tutored by Gamaliel, who is actually in the Sanhedrin. He's known and has been around erudite, very learned, educated men, would know what it's about to theologize and philosophize and debate back and forth in order to make a point. And so all eyes are on Paul for such a time as this. He's got the floor. All the Greek philosophers are leaning in, wanting to know what it is that he's talking about. And in verse 22, he begins. Paul stood up in the meeting in the middle of the council on Mars Hill, and he said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, 
is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples as they would have been surrounded by, made with human hands, nor is God served with human hands as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on the whole earth. Having determined their appointed times, the boundaries of their lands, God made the nations so that they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. For in God we live, move, and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring, we have no need to imagine that the divine being is like gold, silver, or a stone image of Athena that would have been seen overhead, made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things past, but now directs everyone everywhere to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when he intends to judge the world justly by a man he's appointed. God has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. You see, what's so brilliant about Paul's witness is something that we too can learn from and be reminded of even this morning. Is that we learn from scripture immediately that as Paul walks into the city, he's disturbed by the idols, all of the temples that are surrounding. But when he has a chance, instead of condemning them for what it is that they believe, he finds a way to witness and to connect with them. He sees that there's a hunger. He sees that there's a thirst. He knows that he's in a city that knows all about these gods, but doesn't know the one true God. And so instead of isolating them, he says, I see that you have one here to the unknown God. Well, good news is I know exactly whom that God is. For it is the one true God. You see, we live in a world that is becoming more and more curious about spiritual things. I oftentimes hear the phrase, I am spiritual, but I'm not religious. And so there is a hunger. There is a curiosity. There is this desire to try as well as to experiment with this longing and searching to know this God that we know as truth. You see, when we have an opportunity to bear witness to the gospel of Christ, we don't do so beginning by all that you believe and all that you are is wrong. We do so by leaning in that says, when you are exploring, when you say that you're spiritual and not religious, tell me, what are you longing and hoping to find? What have you discovered? Because I believe ultimately what it is that you're longing and searching for is ultimately found in the truth and in the message that is found in Jesus Christ. We also see that Paul uses their own philosophers to ground his understanding of God's message and what they believe is truth. He doesn't begin as he does every other time he witnesses when he's in the synagogue talking about the children of Israel. That wouldn't have meant anything. You see, we learned from Paul this morning that when it comes to us bearing witness to the love of Christ, we do so by coming alongside and entering into relationship with other individuals. We hear in Scripture that out of Athens, the Bible only lists two individuals that accepted Christ. Only two. You know, Paul could have said Athens was a bust. Why did I even go there? Why did I spend my time even there when just two individuals ended up accepting the message? But what we fail to realize is that Athens would eventually become the important center of Christianity, and it started with just a few people. It started with just a small group that grasped the message and transforming element of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this morning, I want you to be reminded that we cannot underestimate what God does with the seeds that we plant in other people's lives. For God has uniquely positioned you and leveraged you and given you a platform to influence others and do not lose heart because what may look like two, God may ultimately multiply by the effect and influence that you have upon another life so that generations later are hearing the message of Jesus proclaimed because you have been faithful today. 
we see that from Athens, Paul moves on to Corinth. And if he was disturbed by the number of idols and temples that were in Athens, Corinth was no better. Corinth was a port city. And so many sailors would come and spend the night. It was known for its brothels, its taverns. It was known for, uh, named after uh, Aphrodite, which had a uh, thousand prostitutes. So that if you went and made a donation to the temple of Aphrodite, then you would receive services of these individuals. And so we don't know a lot about Paul's journey to Corinth just from Acts version, but we are able to understand what Paul experienced when we read his letters to the Corinthians. Now there's believed to be four letters to the Corinthians that Paul wrote. We have two of them known as 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And out of all of his writings, he spends more time talking about sexual immorality. Also, there is a huge temple that has been dedicated to Apollo. And what would happen is that when people would see, as well as, there you go, it still remains to this day. And what would happen is that people would make sacrifices to Apollo. And so then the question became for Christians, can I eat this meat? There's conversation that is had in Corinthians in which Paul's not only dealing with sexual immorality, but he also begins to give instruction. Can we, what food is clean and unclean for us to eat? Knowing what happens in the culture, as is found in Acts, allows us to understand not only, not only the letters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, but 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We also see that in Corinthians there is division. So much so that Paul wrote what probably many of you had read at your wedding. It is one of the most beloved, well-known scriptures that Paul has written. It's known as the love chapter of 1st Corinthians 13. And never do I imagine that when Paul wrote that, did he think they were going to be read at weddings as we do today. Because he was trying to use that as a guide for spiritual maturity. He was trying to convey to a culture and to early new believers that were divided what it means for us to be a community of faith that loves one another. And so this morning, as homework for you this week, I want to invite each of you to spend some time meditating on 1 Corinthians 13, a familiar passage. Except this time, every time you see the word love, I want you to substitute your name. For example, Reagan is patient. Reagan is kind. And as I'm reading that, I would think, well, am I? Am I patient? Am I kind? Do I boast? And as we go through this process, we begin to get our own spiritual pulse of where we are when it comes to our own spiritual maturity. And my prayer is that as you allow your life to enter into the gift of God's Word, as you allow God's Word to actually read you and your own soul, that by the grace of God, our lives would be turned upside down. That we are here today because many of you have had your life turned upside down in the best of ways as you've given your life to Christ. But sometimes we can become comfortable and even complacent and maybe perhaps apathetic. And there needs to be a time when God, we ask that you turn our world upside down once again so that we can bear witness to the love of Christ so that we can all be reminded that we are called to be bold, to be brave, and to be uniquely you. And so take heart that when you were bold and brave, when you sow seeds of God's love to a world that is hungry and thirsty for the word of God, have heart that God indeed will use the gift of your efforts and bless them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.